Hi, my name is Richard Friedman. I'm professor of music at Haverford College, and it's my pleasure to be here to offer uh, what is normally a live, but now is a recorded introduction to one of the wonderful concerts offered by the Philadelphia Chamber Music Society. I'm sorry that I can't be with you live, but this will have to do in the circumstances. Uh, today's program is centered on two pieces, uh, Beethoven String Trio, uh, Opus 9, Number 1, and the Dvorak Opus 87 Piano Quartet. And I'd like to offer a few words of introduction about each of these, pausing to think about some of the cultural and artistic contexts of each of these compositions, but also to delve into some of the musical details. We'll move back and forth between listening and perhaps looking at some details in the score, something that we don't normally uh, have time or space to do during the concerts that are live. Well, uh, let's move directly to the Beethoven Opus 9. Uh, the piece was composed in 1797 and 98, uh, first published in Vienna in 1799, and dedicated to Count Johann von Braun, um, who, despite having a rather unslavic sounding surname, was part of the expatriate world of Russian aristocrats and military folk in Vienna. His father had been uh, was Irish, and uh, he was uh, raised in, in Russia. I suppose they were the oligarchs of their day here in Vienna as ardent supporters of the arts. And think about Beethoven's connections with Lobkowitz and Lipnowski and others. Indeed, during the 1790s, Brown was one of Beethoven's most ardent supporters, and the elaborate French dedication of Opus 9 uh, calls Brown his greatest muse and patron. The Opus 3 string trio and the Opus 10 piano sonatas were dedicated to Brown's wife, Anna Margareta, Anna Margareta as was the Opus 13 uh, sonata pathétique from the same year. Um, but these were not amateur pieces. These were pieces that were part of a long tradition of the resident musico, the artist who would uh, maybe lead uh, aristocratic uh, amateur ensembles, but really play entertainment in aristocratic homes. And since the mid-1790s, Beethoven now securely installed in Vienna, he made the rounds of these houses. And in fact, in the toe of aristocrats like Lichnowski and Lop Prince Lobkowitz, um, he toured places like Dresden and the Prussian court in Berlin uh, for whom he wrote the Opus 5 uh, cello sonatas uh, for the house cellist Duport. Uh, the string trios were played by, uh, in the Brown household uh, by a group led by Ignaz Schupanzik, who was the leader of the great string quartet responsible for the premiere of Beethoven's late string quartets a couple of decades later. So we enter into this aristocratic, virtuosic space uh, in which Beethoven is uh, then circulating and moving. The Opus 10 piano sonatas are the most visible record of this arrival as a composing and improvising pianist, and we need to remember that Beethoven's reputation was secured as much by his performances and his improvisations as it was by his compositional skills. But already by this time of his arrival and prominence in the Brown household, he found himself in competition, at times friendly and at times not, with people like Josef Wolfel, the Mozart pupil, uh, who became uh, uh, an important technical and imaginative rival for him. His works are almost forgotten today, but it's interesting that his Opus 6 uh, in 1798 was dedicated to Beethoven. But then just about this time, in a kind of battle of the hands, Beethoven vanquished Wolfel, who later went to England, where in fact he's, um, he's buried. Uh, but he was very famous, along with Kramer and Dussek and others, as pianists like Beethoven. We tend to chalk up Beethoven's innovations to the myth of his creative genius, as if his ideas were without precedent, but that's not so. And indeed, let's pause and listen to Wolfel's Opus 33, number 3. Now, this is a piece from a bit later on, but it still speaks to his piano prowess. And we can put that side by side with Beethoven's Opus 10, number three, a very virtuosic piece. And I get, as I mentioned before, this was a composition uh, dedicated to the Browns and no doubt performed in their household. We get the same kind of rapid alternation of textures, the same octave passages, rapid octave passages, uh, broken passages in the left hand, uh, sudden uh, vertiginous stops of various kinds. And indeed in the Opus 10, 
we'll come back to remark something that's rather interesting about the way that Beethoven has the themes follow one another and a kind of musical detour. But first, let's listen to Vofel. And now, here's the Beethoven Opus 10, number 3, which speaks in a very similar language. Now, what's very interesting about it is, although we see the same kind of broken octave textures, rapid uh, figuration patterns, really virtuosic material, one thing that's very interesting is the way that he pulls up short and then suddenly takes a detour into the minor key. This is something that a lot of composers were quite fond of, um, that is, in uh, sonata form movements, uh, of which this is one, and we'll see this again in the Opus 9 string trio opening movement, uh, which are conceived of as a tour of keys and in which thematic variety is subsumed within that arc of um, motion from one harmony or key to the next, that a very interesting way of delaying the arrival of the new key is by pulling up short and instead of going into the new tonic key, you go into a related minor key. And it's like a little deformation of the shape. Uh, we're heading somewhere, but suddenly we take a small detour, perhaps uh, stopping for calm reflection, and then moving on again. So let's listen to both the virtuosity and this technique of minor key delay in Opus 10, number three by Beethoven. <laughs> Well, the Opus 9 trios bear witness not to pianistic rivalries, I would argue, but instead to the overwhelming influence of Haydn, whose quartets provided the model for Beethoven's own Opus 18 quartets, which were already budding. Of course, they were published a little bit later, but he's already working on them as far as the uh, documentary evidence is concerned. Uh, and those quartets by Haydn, and of course he was the master of the genre, uh, at this moment, and his symphonies, uh, which were now gaining new fame in London, were models for Beethoven's own Symphony No. 1, and you need only uh, step back to something like the Haydn Symphony No. 88 and compare that with Beethoven's own first symphony to see the influence there. Now, it's interesting because the trios don't really echo Haydn trios. Haydn wrote string trios, but not for violin, viola, and cello. Instead, for an instrument uh, in place of the cello, the baritone, for which he wrote hundreds of pieces uh, because it was played by his aristocratic patron. Uh, but uh, that those trios do not stand as a model in any way for the Beethoven uh, pieces. So we have to look to other genres for the kinds of things that are going on. Well, what happens in the Beethoven uh, Opus 9, number one? It's a four movement piece, Allegro, slow movement, scherzo, and presto, organized like a symphonic composition, organized like the string quartets were as well. Um, and I'd like to focus a little bit on the allegro, 
on the scherzo and just say a few words about the, the finale, um, Presto. Like so many uh, pieces in what we call the galant style, and this is the style that, that uh, scholars now use to describe uh, Haydn's early works and Mozart's early works, and, and indeed some pieces by Beethoven too, the idea is that a manifest um, thematic variety is subsumed in a tour of keys, an arc of tonal movement. You start in a home key, you move away to a related key, normally the dominant if we're in the major. Uh, the second half of the piece uh, uh, explores new areas. It's kind of a far out zone of contrapuntal combinations and changes of harmony. And then eventually you regain the home key, but you also regain the home theme in some way. And this is the familiar arc of exposition, that is the presentation of these themes and their tour of keys. Development, as the 19th century would have it, um, a motion rapidly from one key to the next, and then a regaining of familiar ground in the recapitulation. It's really a two-part form of departure and return in the 18th century. The 19th century tends to think of it in that three-part design that I spoke of before, partly because the pieces just get so much larger. But a very nice spot in this Opus 9 number 1 opening movement is a spot that's very much like what we just heard in the Opus 10 piano sonata, that is after an opening establishment of the key in the main tempo, uh, we suddenly delay on our way to the new key, moving from G up to D, with a minor key shift. Uh, it's very much part of the style that we put this uh, thematic contrast and variety, but also this kind of tonal waiting game um, that's there. And we should go back and listen to that um, carefully. So let's listen to this moment once the Allegro proper uh, gets going. And and there's, of course, more to this because there's a slow introduction to the piece, and I want to come back to the slow introduction a little bit later. But let's listen to the opening part of the Allegro theme and this moment of minor key deformation on the way to the arrival of the dominant. Well, it's interesting, you could go back and we could do this electronically, in fact, we could go back and stop just before that minor key comes in, cut out the music of the minor key, and go directly to the other part, and it would make perfect musical sense. And that, um, in a way, is a marker of what happens in so many of these pieces, that it's an art of combinations. It's uh, the music, because of this multiplicity of themes and the idea of tonal motion, allows you to put themes in different positions, and combine different themes in different order. Um, it's really a modular style, and indeed, if we go back to Haydn's early music, you can really find very modular uh, sorts of pieces. Well, after these two multiple themes and this arc of, of tonal 
progress is established in the opening part of the piece, and that's repeated, by the way, and we'll see whether our performers take that opening repeat, giving us from the first allegro up to the arrival of the dominant, and then back again uh, to repeat that same arc. We move on to a section in which themes are fragmented, presented in dialogue across the instruments, particularly the cello and uh, the violin. The violist uh, is often in an accompanying role in these pieces. We regain the opening theme, and it's a very interesting moment and so characteristic of Beethoven as well that yes, we retain the, regain the opening theme and the opening key, but when we do, there's something sort of odd about it because when you listen to it, you can't quite tell when we've returned, uh, certainly by the moment of those uh, Spartan leaps, yum, ba, dum, ba, dum, bum, that theme that comes in. You clearly have arrived with this big uh, release of volume. Uh, there's something there that is certainly familiar and certainly goes back to the beginning of the Allegro proper. But when you look at it and listen to it more carefully, you realize that what Beethoven has done is actually made that the arrival of the theme is already there before we get to that big release of volume. And indeed, when we go back to the beginning of the piece, definitely we have that point of departure when we move into Allegro at the opening of the piece. But there's a way in which that is in fact itself related to what was going on in the slow introduction. And this idea of integrating the slow introduction into the piece itself by anticipating thematic material and also bringing back that slow introduction at the moment of this recap of the arrival is something that's really remarkable and is, I think, an innovation of Beethoven's. It's towards less of an idea of these pieces as just a garland of independent themes and towards something that is more organically related to each other. And I think if you listen carefully, yum ba da 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 dum, that from the slow introduction comes in, let's say, infiltrates the opening of the theme in a way that we might not at first notice it when we hear it in the slow intro, but we are now reminded of when we get to the recapitulation. So it's not just a replaying, it's a rehearing of earlier material. Well, I hope you go back and listen to that. Um, one of the nice things we can do with these recordings is you can replay them rather than me taking time to play that uh, again during the talk itself. Uh, another thing that's very interesting about this movement is the very end of it. Of course, we get to the recapitulation. We re replay the themes. There's a change in the harmony, but it's the same order of themes, including the minor key deformation. But then when we get to the very end of it, Beethoven has a coda. The coda is technically that which begins the tail of the piece after the recapitulation is already done. And this is very interesting because in the very closing moments, pardon me, in the very closing moments of this coda, we hear all kinds of interesting tremolo techniques down in the viola. And this makes it sound almost symphonic. I'd say there's a kind of a rehearsal here of what he's about to do in the first symphony. So let's listen to that too. <laughs> 
Well, the finale, and I hope you listen for this, also has brilliant, even symphonic techniques in it, uh, with crescendi moving from pianissimo up to forte, some of these other tremolo techniques as well. And I think there are lots of ways in which you can make a connection, we probably should listen to it here, between the finale of Opus 9, number 1, and the Haydn, let's say, Symphony number 102 from the London Symphonies, the finale of that movement. They speak in a similar thematic language, and there's ways in which uh, that what Beethoven is up to is already thinking orchestrally, even with three instruments. He's experimenting with that. Now, of course, there's more to that story when he gets going in the Opus 18 string quartets, and then really where the symphonic style in the quartet literature takes off is in the Opus 59 middle period pieces. But that's another talk, perhaps. But I would like to say a few words about the scherzo in the Beethoven. It's not about the brilliant improvisatory style, and it's not about uh, the lyrical, melancholic style, but instead plays with conventions, in this case of dance forms. And here you hear, uh, you find Beethoven being extremely regular, and you hear him uh, most definitely um, captivated by the kinds of things that Haydn would do in scherzo movements. Of course, in scherzo movements, it's a place of uh, a juxtaposition of extremes, even as it plays with the most humble materials, regular eight-bar phrases, uh, formulaic kinds of patterns, and indeed in the Beethoven you can find all of this, uh, both play with those patterns and also rethinking them to play with our expectations. So for instance in the opening of the scherzo you can hear very regular eight-bar schemes that come right out of the dance literature. And also, if you take a look at the patterns that we hear, especially in the second half of that opening theme, and you can actually see that in the score that I'm putting on the, on the screen here, you notice these descending lines uh, that run in parallel between the parts as you head down towards the cadence. And this is something that every schoolboy and every schoolgirl learning music would have known and learned learned in the 18th century. It was called the rule of the octave, and it was really a kind of improvisatory framework, or at least a schema, where you would learn how to accompany uh, any scalar pattern in a melody or in a bass line with a series of appropriate harmonies that would take us within a key, but also would allow us to move from one key to the next. And these exercises were the bread and butter of early composition lessons. And there was a whole series of these that devolved from something called the rule of the octave, which was an accompanying scheme, but also a compositional scheme, uh, and a whole array of other techniques um, that involved either modulation or openings or arrivals and cadences or prolongations and delays. Indeed, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven all knew this tradition, and it's a tradition that comes out of not just textbooks, but out of the long conservatory tradition in Italy. It was called the Partimento, is the singular Partimenti uh, tradition. And Haydn was raised in this. Mozart uh, was not raised per se, but understood it almost intuitively and heard it. And this was the foundation of conservatory life uh, well into the 19th century, these kinds of techniques continued to be reproduced uh, all the way through 19th century. Debussy learned them, Dandy learned them and taught them uh, in the French Conservatoire uh, until these were all replaced by textbooks in the American Academy. So the Partimento tradition is very much a part of what we hear in this opening part of the scherzo with the rule of the octave 
and other patterns too. Now the trio section of the scherzo is itself interesting for a number of reasons in this particular piece. One is the very Haydn-esque uh, technique that Beethoven does in the trio where he sets us up for a series of feints in which we seem to be moving towards a cadence, moving towards another cadence, moving towards a third cadence, each in a different key, and we're never quite sure which one of these is actually the key that we're headed to. and it seems as though he's setting us up for a return to the main theme of the trio, but in fact what happens is we fold right back into the opening of the scherzo. There's a failure of closure in the trio, uh, a failure of uh, tonal conclusion, and instead we flip right back to the opening. It's also very interesting what Beethoven does is, instead of just repeating the scherzo, because in the traditional dance form pieces, you just write out the scherzo once, then the trio once, and you'd simply tell the musicians, repeat these, but also go da capo scherzo, go back to the head and just play the scherzo again. Instead, what Beethoven does is he writes it out and he varies it. And that's something that also is very forward looking. It's exactly what he does in the famous uh, Fifth Symphony, where the scherzo and trio alike are both repeated and written out in their repetitions. So this is, um, I don't know, a foretaste of things to come. But let's listen to the trio section and the feints in the second half before he then returns to the scherzo. It's a wonderful series of moments and uh, to me sounds just like the sort of thing Haydn would have taught him. Okay, let's continue now thinking about the Dvorak Piano Quartet in E-flat. The piece was composed in 1889 and first performed in 1890 along with the other piano quartet by Dvorak, the one in D, from 1875. Uh, if we think about it in the chronology of Dvorak's output, it's thus poised between works like the Slavonic Dances, Opus 72, that is the second set from 1887, uh, the Piano Quintet, Opus 81, also composed in 1887. Uh, the G Major Symphony, the one that's known as Symphony No. 8 in the conventional numbering, Opus 88. And the Dumki Trio, Opus 90. There's a sort of range of compositions in which uh, the piece is, uh, is, is embedded. It's something of a relative unicorn, I would say, in the chamber music repertory. Uh, the piano quartet is not a common ensemble. Uh, of course, there's a uh, piano quartet in the sense, a piano quintet uh, with full string quartet and piano, and there's piano trio, but piano quartet, that is um, piano, violin, viola, and cello, is not a typical ensemble to which composers turned, and, and it's not a big repertory. Mozart wrote only two of them. Beethoven wrote one. It's among his unnumbered opus output, the Woos, Verha ona Obostzal, W-O-O, if you see them in programs. Much of his juvenilia is this way, and a few other pieces. Schubert, it's only the Adagio and Rondo for piano quartet. Uh, Felix Mendelssohn, there were three, the very first, Opus 1, 2, and 3 for this, for this ensemble. And they are among uh, Brahms's juvenilia, um, Opus 25 and Opus 26 from the 1860s. Really, 
scholars look at these as studies for the symphonies that came uh, much later. And, and there is something of Brahms in this piece that we're listening to. Brahms was uh, notably connected with Dvorak in a musical and a personal sense, um, too. Well, the work takes its place in a period of growing fame for Dvorak. His music now is um, routinely heard in London and Vienna, thanks in, in, in no small part to the support that he had from Brahms and from Eduard Hanslick, the great uh, Viennese music critic uh, some years before, who had um, plucked him out of a series of applicants for uh, a prize sponsored in Vienna for poor musicians from the Austrian Habsburg Empire, uh, and then uh, promoted him in ways advocated for him, uh, particularly with um, Brahms's publisher Simrock in Berlin, uh, who brought out the Moravian duets, uh, the first set of Slavonic dances, and the Moravian duets, by the way, were brought out by Simrock as a kind of folkloric composition, but in German translation. Um, it's kind of ironic. Um, the Viennese saw Dvorak as Slavic, that is decidedly un-German, and we have to um, put ourselves back in uh, the world of 125, 150 years ago to understand the cultural hegemony that uh, German music exercised in this world and the disdain with which uh, Bohemian musicians and Czech musicians in particular uh, were viewed when Liszt met uh, Smetna. He uh, made the snide comment, for instance, that uh, he thought that the Czechs were nothing but fiddlers and, and kind of bumpkins. And indeed, in the aristocratic households of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, the wind players and string players came from village uh, contexts and were often not terribly educated musicians. Um, of course, there were many great ones, but uh, they were also uh, viewed with disdain. There was a kind of a cultural and, um, and maybe racialized or at least ethnically prejudiced uh, view that they had of them. And yet, composers like Smetna, uh, in the case of Dvorak, and Dvorak played viola under him in, in, in the Prague Orchestra, scoffed at Dvorak's pan-Slavic borrowings, um, in which he here touched on the Dumka, here on the Furiant, here on the Mazurka, variously from Ukrainian, Polish, and Bohemian traditions. Uh, they thought this was a kind of a dilettantism, and um, that Dvorak was in a kind of an aesthetic bind. He sought to assimilate and to be promoted, but he was also acutely aware of the prejudice with which he and his fellow countrymen uh, were viewed. And it's interesting to go and take a look at Dvorak's letters to Brahms. They're quite revealing in this context. They are obsequious in the extreme. He treats the Viennese musicians as a kind of royalty. Um, he's, he's, he's abject in his self-deprecation as he approaches Brahms, talking about how he's not worth, how he's not worthy and the noble Brahms will be an advocate for his career. He even effaces his very name. It's, it's very interesting in these letters. My colleague Michael Beckerman has written about this and other biographers as well. He never signs his name to Brahms as Antonin, uh, but instead of, he abbreviates it Anton, Germanizes it, or just Ant, right? He's sort of uh, uh, effacing his own ethnicity. Um, and I think it's interesting in this respect that the nationalist gestures that we find in Dvorak's uh, Opus uh, 81 and in works like Opus 87 are confined very often to middle movements. It's something he hides away. Right? He doesn't he doesn't bring these uh, these tendencies to the fore in the opening and the closing movements. And indeed, um, if we begin with the third movement of uh, the piece on our program uh, this afternoon, the Scherzo. Uh, of course, we, we just observed a little bit earlier how the scherzo was a place for uh, a study in contrasts, uh, derived from the old uh, social dance tradition of a minuet and then a trio with, well, quite literally a reduced texture. So you might play a quartet orchestra and then leave out the viola part uh, for the trio to have some contrast in the sound and the sonic idiom that's there. 
um, regular phrasing, balanced tonal forms. Um, but already in Haydn's quartets and then in Beethoven's, as we saw before, there were places to not only juxtapose these two textures or juxtapose contrasting keys, but to juxtapose the irreconcilable, the courtly on one hand and the pastoral on the other, the gallant, right, that uh, easing, pleasing variety, easy, pleasing variety that uh, had been so much a part of the classical idiom and the learned. Um, contrapuntal music. So even in Beethoven's pieces and in the early 19th century, think about Mendelssohn and others, scherzo, the, the means joke, scherzi are jokes, are uh, places to explore uh, the imaginative, the fantastic, um, a, 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 topic, a topicality that could be chromatic or exotic or even borrow from some of these traditions. And so here uh, Dvorak puts his own twist on this tradition of irreconcilables. Uh, the scherzo movement opens with a nod to the Viennese waltz or Lendler tradition with a call to attention, yump bump, yump bump, sort of like tapping on the stand to get everybody ready to dance, and then a lilting tune right out of the ballroom. Although it's interesting, if you listen carefully and count up carefully, this ballroom dance is not the mandatory eight plus eight, that is 16 bars, but it's only 15. There's something cut short. Uh, maybe he's having a kind of a wink and a nod at that tradition. And what's interesting there is that he modulates starting in, um, he starts in E flat and instead of modulating to B flat, he modulates to a rather modal sounding G minor position. And this sort of exploration of keys that are a third apart, so E flat, F, G is a third away, and that's a third away from G flat, A flat, B flat, the dominant that will come. So instead of fifth relations, now third relations, that's something that's very important in romantic music and in the 19th century. He arrives, in other words, in G minor, something not completely unexpected in the world of the 19th century. But then, out of nowhere, we suddenly go to a completely different landscape, not the Lendler, but instead maybe a Roma folk tune with augmented seconds and drone effects down in the cello. Are we in the ballroom or in a village? And what's also very interesting is that this tune comes back later in the piece uh, between uh, the, in, in kind of a canon between the violin and the piano, uh, the learned making use of the humble in this way. So let's listen to this wonderful moment where uh, the major key lilting waltz yields to first a modality in the minor key, but then this augmented second. And then there's another little transformation where it goes to E flat again, but with a flattened seventh. And this also sounds sort of modal and, and as if he's drawing on folk traditions uh, too. Um, so let's listen to just that moment. Well, eventually this reverie returns uh, to the opening, Lendler, 
um, and and it dissipates and we go back to E flat major, but now it's a difference. Things have been reorchestrated. The strings now play pizzicato rather than having the lyrical melody itself. They had the tune before, now they play accompaniment. And the piano plays the melody, but it's not just playing the melody in imitation of the strings. It plays airy high tremolos, um, transposed up an octave. And uh, here some scholars have wondered whether Dvorak is 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 maybe thinking of the cymbalum, having the piano imitate the hammer dulcimer heard uh, in in many places in that part of the world. In Hungarian music, it's most familiar, but it's in Roma music, it's in Czech music too, or in uh, urban restaurants of a certain vintage. And here, uh, a recording made in the Chardas restaurant in New York in 1951 is Dick Marta playing the Brahms Hungarian Rhapsody number no. eight. And Here, well, maybe the uh, assonance, the resemblance to what we just heard in the Dvorak, but you can also hear perhaps Dvorak playing with the urban and the rural, or the ways in which some parts of the rural have been pulled up into urban experience as a kind of exotic showpiece, divorced from their original context in various ways. And that tells another part of this uh, story too. I don't know what Dvorak had in mind, but it's very interesting the ways in which he plays the urban and the rural off against each other and then brings them together in this uh, reprise in the scherzo movement. Well, our vision of Dvorak is based on his time in America, of course, and as an advocate of a pluralistic musical language. Um, and that view often misses these nuances of maybe the political side of the ways in which Dvorak is um, at sometimes uh, adopting uh, the German and Austrian musical vocabulary, sometimes uh, critiquing it from outside, and sometimes saying something quite different and other in these uh, kind of hidden moments. Um, yeah, and maybe evoking for us the slights uh, that Slavic composers were sub subjected to in, in this period and this part of the world. Of course, Dvorak, like Schubert before him, had a remarkable talent for melody, long cantabile lines that seem to spin out one after the next in his most famous work. There's no lack of that melodic invention here in Opus 87, but it's worth noting that in this piece, in contrast to some other pieces by uh, Dvorak. The lines are shorter, they're more varied, they're more motivic, and they're more interconnected than in previous pieces. It's as if he's kind of thinking in a more contrapuntal sense. He's thinking about Brahms, because Brahms is very good at this idea of motivic development, uh, even as his melodies unfold. And he's also very good at reworking those melodies in new textures and new harmonies. And a great example of this is the slow movement from this composition uh, that we're hearing uh, this evening, the piano quartet, the second movement, Lento. Well, it, it opens, and, and we'll listen to some uh, extended chunks of it because it's really quite wonderful. Um, he first states and then reorchestrates five relatively short themes. It's a surprisingly simple uh, shape uh, to the composition. Um, number three and number five are closely related to each other because of a repeated pickup note in the piano part that you'll see in the score and that you can hear. Um, -da 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 -da, that little idea picks up in each one of these. Played differently, but there is a kind of um, rhythmic and melodic resemblance between the two. So there's a maybe an organic unity between things that seem a little bit different.
they are both first heard in D flat major, that is the third of these themes and the fifth of these themes, but they're separated by a, a kind of volcanic eruption uh, heard not in D flat, but in a minor key, and it's very interesting because Dvorak, the minor key for him here is C sharp minor, C sharp being what musicians call the enharmonic equivalent of D flat. They're the same pitch on the piano. It's like you've spelled the same tone differently. Obviously they could be a little bit different on the violin and on other string instruments because you play the D flat just a little bit differently than you play the C sharp, but they are the same pitch reinterpreted. So it's as if he's punctured through, if we imagine theme three and theme five as being the same thing, he's sort of separated them, pulled them apart by this volcanic eruption in the minor key. And we've seen that before in Beethoven, this idea of heading somewhere, arriving there, but then delaying the sustained arrival. And it's interesting in the case of this second movement, <clears throat> pardon me, that it begins in G flat. The D flat of measure of theme number three and five is the dominant, and he inserts the minor key in the middle of it, just as Beethoven had done. We saw in Opus 10 Piano Sonata, and in the Opus 9 first movement. Um, now that deferral of the key or the interruption of the key was a favorite trick of Brahms and it was a favorite of Schubert's before him um, uh, through that detour. And indeed, uh, we can pause in a moment to think about how this is very much like something that you hear in the, let's say the Schubert um, uh, string quintet, uh, its slow movement has a very similar kind of explosion uh, where a lyrical quiet movement is suddenly interrupted by a parallel uh, journey into the minor key. But before we get to that, one of the things that's very interesting is that the main theme of, uh, uh, the main motive of this theme for yam, ba -da -dum, two sixteenth notes and then the following eighth or dotted eighth that come after it, the sobs that we hear in, uh, in octaves in the violin and then echoed down in the cello part were in fact already hidden in theme three. And looking at the score, you can see how very slowly they start to emerge in dialogue between the string parts and the piano part in already in theme three as a kind of echo of itself becomes a premonition of this explosion that comes through afterwards. And so that idea of, again, motivic connections among things that seem very different uh, tells us something about Dvorak's um, not only melodic invention, but his compositional capacity to weave uh, different things together using common threads uh, and elements. And uh, the second time through, that, Be that uh, pardon me, that Dvorak plays these five themes and he goes through them again in order. We'll hear the interruption, but I want you to listen in particular in performance when he gets to theme five the second time through because it's the piano that gets to play the sobs uh, in, in the octaves. Uh, 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 that it, pardon me, the second time through he gets to uh, theme four, it's the piano that gets to play the sobbing octaves and that's a nice moment too. Well, there are other riches in this piano quartet, and I encourage you to listen for the ways in particular themes from uh, the first movement come back in the very end of the piece. And one passage there stands out for me, and you will watch and listen, which is finally when the violist gets to play one of these themes. And in fact, the replaying of the theme from the first movement comes back at last in the hands of the violist. And I can't help but think that this was Dvorak speaking up for himself. He was a violist, and now and then he gives something nice to this instrumentalist who's often stuck playing accompaniment role. Well, I hope you've uh, learned something from this brief introduction, and I very much hope that you'll enjoy the concert to follow. Thank you for your patience. This is Richard Friedman from Haverford College. Good evening. <laughs>